Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk here. I can't tell if this thing is working or not. I can't see any questions. My phone is acting funny. But you know what? We're going to skate through it. It's telling me to rotate my phone. So, tell me. Somebody tell me if I'm upside down or oh, I'm sideways. Okay, well, here we go. I'm going to fix that. Okay. Oh, great. Holy cow. This is pretty weird. This hasn't happened before. Rotate your phone. Gee whiz. Holy cow, I might have to start over. <laughs> That's pretty weird. Pretty weird, pretty weird. Still upside down? Holy cow, is that it now? Woo, am I right side up? Somebody help me out here. There you go, Tory Rhodes says. Okay, I guess I need to do something on my settings. i tell you how smart I am. I have no idea. Yep. Oh, I'm laying down on the job. Yeah, John, I am. I don't know what's going on. Okay, so is it good now? Okay, Tory Road says I'm upside down. <laughs> upside down. Upside down. Okay, well, then we're going to spin it around like this. Now. Let's try that. Okay, now am I right side up? Gee whiz, this is complicated today. I don't know what's going on. I did something to my settings, I guess. I don't know. This is weird. Weird, 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 weird. Oh, now Tori says it's perfect. Now your questions are coming in upside down. So, I might have to figure this out. We're going to have to free will tonight, guys. We'll see. All right, so now, heck, I found it on my dadgum laptop now. Looks like it's looking kind of goofy. I got to turn off the music, turn off the sound. Holy cow, I need some technical help here. Okay, now I don't have to listen to it. Okay. Wow. I'm not even going to look at my phone. This is weird. All right, holy cow. That's a little bit of a distraction. But, Pond Boss Magazine, that's where we are. Hanging out in the balmy hills. And balmy, I do mean balmy. I mean, you know, I can't sit here and talk about weather to all you guys from the northern states. But uh, I know you guys are having some cold, warm, cold, super cold, then warm. Which has kind of been a weird, weird winter. I don't know what to expect. And I don't know what anybody does. So uh, we're just going to have to kind of deal with what nature throws at us. Let's see here. All right, now it looks like I'm right side up. <laughs> reading all these comments everybody's coaching me through here go get your wife bob says oh catfish birch catfish birch tell me go get my wife you know what you know what she would do she would look at me and say honey you're upside down and i'd say okay baby what do you want me to do she'd say get right side up and i'd say okay how do you do that she'd say well you, you, you usually right side up just do what you've been doing well, now my phone ain't doing it, so tonight we're just going to play it as we go with a weird one here. You know, I thought I'd talk about tonight about um, what to do to push your pond to make it the best it can be. And then, once you get it that way, or you push it past the normal limits, what should you expect? So, uh, I'm gonna, you guys start pitching some questions. I'll greet everybody as I can. I see, uh, let's see, holy cow, I see... See, of course, Bill Russell, Frank James, Jason Nipstad, John Funk, John Cruitt, Tory Rhodes, Bill Russell, Frank James, John Henry, Zach Russell, Drew Hay, Drew Hayes in the bulldozer business, I understand. Mike Cottrell, John Cruitt, Billy Birch, the catfish man. Let's see who else we got in here. Troy Todd, John Henry. Yep, I'm laying down on the job. If you only knew. Lance Faber, Pat Williamson. Victor Moberg, maybe needs to be in portrait mode. You know what? Rather than do it while I'm live, I'm going to be upside down because I'm looking at it upside down, but right side up on my laptop. Yep, John Funk, weirdest winner in 100 years. Yep, I can't remember quite back as far as you can, but... uh, <laughs> woo All right, Mike Stevenson, Rain Rain, East Texas. That's right. Mike Augustine checking in. Let's see. 
Yep, hey, Fred Bingaman, I'm glad you said that. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine makes you eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss mug. So uh, here's what I want you to do. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like and share this video right now to your timeline. And uh, people will get a big chuckle out of the beginning because I'm a real professional at this. <laughs> you can tell it. Let's see here. Okay, Jason Nipstad's got a question already. He says, uh, newly stocked bluegill, what size Purina Mill fish feed should I use? Well, I'll tell you what. You need to get a Texas Hunter feeder because I see Chris Blood just joined us. Texas Hunter is one of our sponsors, but they absolutely make the best fish feeder on the market. But the right size fish food for newly stocked bluegill, I'll tell you what I do. I use Purina Mills Aquamax uh, MVP. It's got nine pellet sizes, and the cool thing about that fish food that I, and I kind of helped, I kind of helped, I did help develop that fish food and the idea of it. But since there's nine pellet sizes, about 70% of those pellets float and the rest of them slowly drift down through the water column. So the most aggressive fish come and feed at the surface, then the remaining fish are able, the less aggressive fish or the smaller fish can eat as that feed goes down through the water column. So I think that's a good way to go. Aquamax MVP, Chris Ketchum checking in. Daniel Hendricks got it. So uh, I want to talk to you about what it takes to really push your pond to the next level. What you got to do is, of course, you, you, any of you that have seen more than one of these videos know, know what I preach first. First thing I preach is what are your goals? Establish your goals. If you know what your goals are, if your goals are to grow the biggest largemouth bass on the planet, you know, or it's I want to have some fish that, where my grandkids can go out on the dock and catch a stringer full of bluegills like what? Fred Bingaman does over there in Brownstown, Illinois, you know, or if you're saying, you know, I just want a really healthy pond with a good group of just naturally healthy fish, set your goals. That's job one. Then the next thing is you got to make sure your water's happy. Where's Dave Weber? He's going to tease me for saying that because that's what I believe. Happy water, happy water. Here's what that means. You want good, clean water that provides a steady, autonomous medium for fish to live in without a lot of dramatic chemistry and biology changes. Now, here's what that means. <laughs> you want your water to be, um, the pH to be balanced. If, if your pH is acidic, figure that out and lime it if it's appropriate. Here's Danny Mack, beautiful day in Texas. Yeah, it's a real pretty day in Texas. The, uh, uh, other parts about the water, you want it to be biologically healthy, so the right balance of plants, and you want the right kind of plankton and the right algae blooms, that sort of thing. If you've got that, and somebody's honking at us, so if somebody, so if you've got good water that's aerated and autonomous temperatures, you know, healthy, that's what you want, water. The second thing is the best habitat. If you've got the best habitat for the different species of fish that you expect to grow, then you're going to have success with that. Then the next thing is the best food chain. You really, if you don't have the right food chain, you're not going to grow the fish that you want. Now, if you really want to push a pond, a, a, a pond's fishery, you got to have the right genetics and you got to have a harvest plan. Now, here's where it gets a little more fun. Is you can actually use some of your fish as your harvest plan. Now, think about that for a minute. What's he talking about? you can use some of your fish as part of your harvest plan. Well, let's say one of the goals is to grow giant bluegills. Well, we already know, everybody that has bluegills knows, we know that they're going to over, overpopulate. We know that. That's just going to be the nature of the beast, isn't it? We know that bluegills are going to spawn a lot, and they're going to grow, and they're going to overpopulate. That's kind of the nature. So, if you really want to grow a big bluegill, you got to be able to harvest big bluegill. Now, there's nobody in the world that's going to go out there and try to catch 2,000 bluegill out of a three-acre pond that are three inches long. Nobody's going to do that. But if you've got predator fish in there that will eat some, they're going to help you. If one of your goals is, goals is to grow huge bass, then you need to manage your bass fishery so that you get as many bass as you can up to 18 inches, 18 and a quarter inches as fast as you can because they'll turn around and start eating young of the year bass and overcrowded bluegill. So managing the dynamics of your fish population is one way that you can really push your pond to its limits. Let's see what Zach Russell says here. Big blue catfish, 50 pounds plus, good or bad for our particular lake. 
specifically wondering on their effect on controlling the large frying pan sized gizzard shad. Also curious on their effect on taking over structure and taking them over, kicking bass and crappie off them. They will not kick bass and crappie off of structure. They will eat them. A 50 pound blue cat will eat a three pound bass. I've seen it. I'll never forget, I was, uh, 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 there was a fishing club down south of Houston that contracted with me one time to analyze their 20 acre club lake. And it was, um, what was the Bass Samaritans Club or something, I don't remember, but anyway, because it was back in the, um, heck, that was the early 80s, believe it or not. And so, what they were, what they were worried about was that there were too many big blue cat that were disrupting their bass fishing, because what would happen is the club members would come out and go bass fishing, and they'd get broken off, they'd get their gear torn up. So they said, you know what, we think the blue cats in this lake are really disrupting the bass fishery. So we went out there, started setting some trot lines, gill nets, electro fishing, and I caught, the first night, I caught a 52-pound blue cat, put it in, in a big, big holding tank, dressed it the next day, and it had a three-pound bass in its gullet. There was a tail just barely sticking out. That 52-pound blue cat had eaten a three-pound bass. In their gut was a remnant of some gizzard shad as well. So, let's see here. Um, so, Zach, you know, and I saw some pictures of those. Of, I saw a picture of one blue cat. But blue cat, yeah, they'll eat gizzard shad. You bet they will. They'll eat those carp that you guys have in McFadden Lake. And so, uh, yeah, they, 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 they are... They're actually a more top-end predator fish than largemouth bass, simply because they get so big. There's Danny Tolliver. Ran into him at the at the at the barber shop the other day. Good to see Danny. Scott Hoensey with Karina. Hey man, we were just talking about Aquamax MVP, Scott. Good to see you. Scott Lindsay. Good to see you. So if you really want to, if you really want to push your pond to the next level, you need to feed the fish. And you know, 25 or 30 years ago. Most of the fish foods were grain-based fish foods. They were designed for production ponds and aquaculture facilities, primarily grain-based fish foods for catfish, you know, and fish like that. Now, there were some fish foods back then for salmon, salmonids, and trout, things like that, but th they were so heavy and fat, had a little bit different protein. So uh, what's happened over the years is Purina Mills has really stepped in and taken charge of the marketplace and done a lot of research and figured out the best nutrition for Feed train largemouth bass, for bluegill, for hybrid striped bass, for tilapia, for channel catfish, any of the fish that you want to stock that will eat fish food, one of the best ways to push your ponds beyond its natural limits is to feed the fish. Now here's the way that it works. When we have when we have trophic systems, there's Ben Strains and Debbie loves Happy Valentine's Day Eve, honey. I'll be home in a little bit. We'll eat a chocolate covered strawberry or something cool. <laughs> Oh gosh, I saw a bunch of eyes roll on that comment. So, uh, what are you guys doing for your wives on Valentine's Day? Come on, show me. So, uh, uh, anyway, the um, ways, it, so, you know, a pond's productivity is based on its trophic level. So, in other words, every time you look at a trophic level shift, and I'm going to explain that here in a minute, you're going to see 10 times the change. So, if you've got a thousand pounds of plankton per unit of water, say an acre of water, that thousand pounds of plankton is going to transfer into about a hundred pounds of something else, insects, tiny fish. That hundred pounds of tiny fish is going to be consumed by bigger fish, which is going to change into 10 pounds. And that 10 pounds is going to grow one pound of predator fish. So, if you're trying to manage your pond naturally, one way to do that is to keep the water fertile in the springtime and early summer. Now, there's quite a bit of uh, research going on nowadays about how to manage algae blooms and plankton blooms to try to minimize the risk of bad algae blooms. So, there's some more science coming in. Ordinarily, what I would tell people, and I still believe this, is let's get our water fertile and do that in late March, early April. Keep it that way until about the first or middle of June to let the water go clear. And when that happens, then you've pretty well taken care of the new young of the year fish. You fed them, the newly hatched fish, and you've helped push your pond toward its best limit. Let's see here, Connor Osowski, just tuning in, so you may have touched on this. I heard that you had a 
spoken about blue catfish and the impact on largemouth bass. If blue catfish are desired, how do you think they do in small, less than 500 acres, lakes with adequate forage? They'll do great. Matter of fact, in, in, a, in a lake less than 500 acres, you could probably grow some uh, blue cats up to 75 or 80 pounds if you know what you're doing. Now, I know you can grow a lot of 30 to 50 pound blue cats. I've seen, like I mentioned earlier, I've seen 50 to 60 pound blue cats in lakes 20 acres. So a 500 acre lake, you can grow some giant ones. Now, you know, here's the, here's the catch. They're top end predators. So they're going to compete with other predators. So if they're your target species, yeah, you can do real well with them. If they're not your target, they're going to disrupt your target species, which might be hybrid striped bass, might be channel catfish, it might be uh, largemouth bass, might be bluegill. But they are definitely going to interfere with that. Chris Blood, hey Bob, can you tell us what are the benefits? Oh, here comes some questions. What are the benefits of using automatic fish feeders, fish feeders to grow better, bigger forage and trophy bass? You know what? I'll tell you this. I'm going to tell you you have to have a fish feeder. Because if, if you really want to push a pond to its limits, you got to consistently feed them. You have to do that. You, a, a pond is not going to go beyond its limits. And when I say, let me do, let me say this. The limits of a pond are what it will do with minimal effort on your part. And most of the time for the ponds we manage, people don't like that. You know, they don't, they don't want to try to live with 45 or 50 pounds of bass per acre. And think about that. 50 pounds of bass per acre, an acre is about as big as a football field. So if you're, if you're going to try to manage a pond naturally and let it do what it does on its own, 40, 45, 50 pounds of bass per acre is going to be it. That could be 10, 5 pound bass. That never is. You know, it's, it's going to be 80 to 100 bass. And they're going to range in size from 10 inches up to 5 or 6 pounds. But the bigger fish are going to be really rare. You're not going to see very many. So on a 3 acre pond, you might have 2 bass over 5 pounds. You know, unless you nudge it. So the benefits of having a fish feeder, and I'll tell you this, I think you need to have a fish feeder for every three to five acres of water if you're going to push your pond beyond its natural limits. So uh, feeding the forage fish, now here's what's cool about feeding fish, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of feeding fish. That doesn't mean I'm opposed to not feeding fish, because I'm not. If you don't want to feed the fish, don't feed the fish. But tonight's topic is what do you do to push your pond to, its, to, its, to beyond its natural limits? If you're going to do that, you got to feed the fish. You should also consider fertilizing. Now, there's always a limiting factor. Almost every single pond that has a fishery, that almost every one, the number one limiting factor is fish food or something the bass can eat or the bluegill can eat. So you can, you can change that limiting factor with a feeder. Now, the benefits of having a feeder is it feeds in the same place, same time, every day. Once twice, three times, whatever your protocol is. So uh, I think it's wise to feed the fish. And having a feeder, home run, because you don't have to be there. Now, fish are going to respond to consistency. They get conditioned. It's not like, well, if you show up at 4 o'clock today to feed them off the dock and show up tomorrow at 7 and the next day at 2, they're not going to be consistent. They're going to be as consistent as you are. You're not consistent, they won't be there. So a fish feeder gives consistency. You can also measure the quantity so that you know you're feeding the right amount of fish food. You know, I do think it's important to observe the fish feeding so you can see them if you know they're eating or not and how much they're consuming, you know, and, 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 and that way you know if they're eating the amount they should be because if they're eating it all, cleaning it up, and within about 15 or 20 minutes, then you're doing a good job. So now, what'll happen, let's see, uh, Chris, part of, his, part of his Chris's question is trophy bass. Now, trophy bass... You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So a trophy to me might not be a trophy to you, and a trophy to you might be, not be a trophy to you. You know, Jacob West out there might think that an eight-pound bass is a trophy, where, you know, Kevin Van Dam might think a 13-pound bass is a trophy. You know, so the bottom line, to get, to get your top-end predators as big as they're going to get, is it's going to take at least 10 pounds of bait fish per pound of gain plus a maintenance diet. Now what fish food does, this is really cool. Scott Hohensey might want to chime in here. Uh, Scott works for Purina Mills. He's in the wildlife side. He's real active with the fish food side of the Purina's business too, so I'm glad he's on here. Uh, it takes about, if you're feeding the Aquamax um, sport fish feeds, the MVP, the 300, 400, 500, 600 series of feeds, those are all different pellet sizes. 
That is fish meal based fish food. And those your the fish that eat that will convert it at about one point three to one. So that is outstanding conversion. Now that where it gets a little confusing, you say, okay, well wait, Bob, at every trophic level, it takes about ten pounds to get one pound at the next level. Well, in this case, we're talking about dry weight. So it takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a bass to gain a pound, but if you were to take that 10 pounds of bait fish and wring them out, there'd be a little more than eight pounds of water. You know, two pounds of goodies, give or take a little bit. Plus the effort it took to chase them down, catch them and eat them, and then digest the water, process all that. So fish food is real, real efficient and it's, it's cost effective. I think uh, MVP and the other Purina uh, sport fish products cost about what is it, about 90 cents a pound, I think, maybe 80 to 90 cents a pound. So you're gonna spend a dollar twenty to a dollar sixty a pound to grow a pound of bait fish that's gonna help feed your trophy fish on up the food chain. So feeding the fish with a feeder is a real efficient, intelligent way to push your pond to its limits. Drew Hay says, I've used a winter drawdown to force the bluegill into the deeper water to feed the bass during a cool month. Smart. Very smart. Seemed to work well to thin the bluegills down. Your thoughts? Just my farm dirt boy approach. Yeah. No, I think that's a great way to do it. Now, one thing you got to be careful about with a drawdown, that kind of depends on where in the world you are. You know, if you're in West Texas and you draw a pond down, you can get arrested just as like you can for cattle rustling because <laughs> it doesn't rain enough out there. You know, but if you're in an area where you can draw the water down and leave it down for six weeks, you know, draw it down now and leave it until March, middle of March, first of April, and then let it fill back up with rains or a well or however you do it. That's a way, that's a great way to do it because what you do then is you can find your fish, you bring them out of their safe zones. Oh gosh, I hate that word. But you draw them out of their safe zones, get them out in open water and bask and feed on them heavily. And then what happens is the, uh, when the water fills back up and the pond fills back up and the water temperature is right, it triggers a spawn and it triggers it every time. You know, when the river rises, that, that triggers a spawn in fish. When your pond rises, that triggers a spawn in fish. So that's, so yeah, a winter drawdown is a good idea. It's a good idea sometimes to kill vegetation, but it's also a good idea to, to draw the, the bluegill into deeper water, especially if your bluegill have a tendency to overpopulate. Some ponds, especially in the Midwest and the North, Bluegill tend to draw down. So if you could draw, I mean, uh, to overpopulate. So if you draw the water down, then the bass can thin them down. They can go into the spring in a lot better shape. More eggs, more babies, bluegills that survive. Now, if you, if you leave a draw down, if you draw it down in November and don't let it fill back up until March, then your bluegills can get decimated. You may not have enough that can replenish the fishery, especially if you've got some big bass in there. So I think your timing is important on a drawdown. Anthony, let's see, Leanne checked in. Anthony McKeever. We have a six acre pond in central Georgia. Brim put in pond in 2007. Bass put in in 2008. We got up to catching seven, eight, nine pound bass up until a few years ago. Since then, we haven't caught any more bass over six pounds. Is this due to some bass dying of old age? We, let's see, we were, let me click on see more here. We were told those original bass Put in the pond it will always be our biggest bass and we should consider pulling the plug and starting over and that comment hurt how true is that we put a low of shad, load of shad in every other year never pull out brim keep the pond fertilized okay anthony here's the here's the million dollar question do you know the genetics of those fish if you don't and you if you can presume that they're northerns or prove that they're northerns that's as big as northern bass get a nine pound northern bass is huge. You know, with a six acre pond in central Georgia, you should have, with good genetics, the opportunity to grow some really nice double digit bass, you know, 10 to 12 pounds. So, uh, there's Trana Madonna, she checked in. Good to see you, Trana. So, uh, anyway, um, Anthony, uh, you've got a couple of choices. I don't think you necessarily need to pull the plug, but one thing I'd do, is I would, I'll tell you what do, check in with um, Aquatic Environmental Services, Greg Grimes. Where'd you get your fish? That's going to be one question. Also talk to American Sport Fish Hatchery over in Montgomery, Alabama. Those guys have got some genetically superior fish. So my gut instinct is that you may not have had the genetics to start with that you wanted to get bass up to that size. 
That may not have been lined out in your goals early on. Jeff Nolan. Jeff Nolan. Hi, Pond Boss. Long time listener. First time liver. Huh? Typo, I'm sure. Craig Guffin, Sedalia, Missouri. All right, Zach coming back there from uh, Fayetteville, North Cagalac. Is there benefits of stocking Threadfin to take some feeding pressure off bluegills and hopefully in turn allow them to grow bigger size and spawn more successfully when using feeders and man-made spawn beds? Just find, trying to figure out a way to get our bluegill bigger. and are Absolutely right. <coughs> There's Tim Wood. He's the president of the Society of Lake Management Professionals checking in. Zach, yes, there is benefits to stocking Threadfin Shad because what Threadfin Shad do is they live in a different niche. They're going to go out in open water. They're going to spawn in the grass. They're going to they're going to glean plankton from the water. That's how they're going to feed. And they're and, and the ten. I'm going to tell you actually nine to fourteen inch bass. That's going to be a staple for them. And if you can pull a bunch of those nine to fourteen inch bass off of the bluegills around the perimeter and get them out chasing shad, then your bluegill survival rates are going to go up. Now that's going to be directly proportionate to how many bass you've got. And I know your situation. I think it's a smart thing to do for you to do that. Matt Singley from Foxworth, Mississippi. Todd Austin, good to see you. Let's see. Um, Jack Hamilton, Anthony McIver, F1s. Okay, if you stocked F1s, Anthony, then, then the only reason that you don't have bass that are, let's see, you stocked those in 2007, so this is 19, that's 12 years ago. You should have some bass that big by now. You know, it's, I'm not going to tell you that you don't, but if you haven't caught any, that's probably a pretty good sign. You know, I don't think you need to pull the plug, but what you should do is you should come back in and stock some of known genetics because starting off with F1s, your genetics are going to be diluted every time the fish spawns. Now, that doesn't mean that the genetic integrity is going to be called into question, but anytime you get an F1 crossing with an F1, there's going to be some percentage of those fish that aren't, aren't going to do well. So it could be a good idea. Now, tell you, here's what I would do with that six-acre lake. Have it surveyed and find out the ratios of fish that you've got and figure out why you have what you have. And there may be a reason. You know, it could be that those fish were stuck at 14 inches for two and a half years and weren't able to push above that, and they topped out at nine pounds. If that's the case, you've got a population dynamics issue, and you can change that. Steve Lewis from Hot Springs checking in. Let's see, um, Sheridan Ashmore, howdy. Jack Walker, Middle Georgia here also. Do you have any experience with Owens and Williams fish hatchery and their genetics? You know, I don't know. I, you know, Owens, Owens and Williams have been in it a long, long time. They've got an outstanding reputation. I've heard nothing bad about them. I've heard nothing but good, and I don't know them. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that, but I don't really know them. So uh, let's see here. Jack Hamilton, I'm in southern Indiana. Does stocking tilapia make sense for a one-acre pond with four-year-old bass of bluegill? You know, first of all, the thing <coughs> I'm going to tell you, Jack, is to make sure it's legal in Indiana to stock tilapia because some states it's not. I know next door to you in Indiana, I mean, Illinois, it's not. So find out if they're legal. Okay, the tilapia can make sense... If you want to control algae, you want to beef up your food chain, increase survival rates of bluegill, tilapia are real, real good for that. So if you want, if, if that makes sense and they're legal, do it. Now check in with Matt Rail at American Pond and Lake Management in Rushaville. If anybody knows about it, Matt Rail, R-A-Y-L, look him up. Drew Hayes talking to Tim Wood here, just picking Mr. Lush's brain on my cool weather drawdown technique. Apparently, I somewhat know what I'm doing. LOL, a blind squirrel finds a nut. <laughs> okay, Sheridan says, I keep hearing how hydrilla is both bad and good. I heard it makes the water clear. Is it true? There's not one thing good about hydrilla. Nothing. Now, if I'm sitting in a room of anglers and they all have raccoon eyes because they've been sunburned around here, they're going to argue with me forever, but I'm going to I'm going to win this argument. Uh, hydrilla is 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 not good. Hydrilla is so prolific, grows so fast, is so invasive that it sucks all the nutrients out of the water and consumes. I tell you this, it grows six inches per day, up and out. 
There are other native plants that are way better than hydrilla. If I've got any customers, any of my clients that ever tell me they have hydrilla, and I find out they did that on purpose without talking to me first, they're fired. I don't like hydrilla. Now, I, I'll tell you this. I will concede that there are some lakes where hydrilla works, but they're all big public lakes subject to huge drawdowns. Uh, one of them I can think of is... Uh, Oh, good gosh. Help me out here. The one at Del Rio, Texas on the Rio Grande River. You know, a big, big lake that draws down 30 or 40 feet, then it rises 30 or 40 feet. In a case like that, then hydrilla can be okay because the lake naturally controls it. Let's see. Danny Mac says, I think I need more bass, like two or three more. <laughs> One-tenth acre going on two years in April, but a boatload of bluegills. Most of the original is stocked. Big 50, going on two years old, caught one nine-inch, weighing 12 ounces, and a bunch of four to six inches. They're fed good stuff. High, high fish meal. Let's see here. Meanwhile, this morning, my minute trap had about 30 bluegills from inch and a half to two inches. Dang, I thought I was getting forage limited. You're not, are you? It's okay to throw in a few pounds of crawfish. Now, if you the, the bass at 17 inches look heavy. That's fine. If you want to put three or four more bass in there, do it. But make sure they're 17 or 18 inches long. And then keep paying attention to your uh, to your relative weights of your bass. And then look at the bluegills, just like you're doing. I, I love the fact that you'll set a trap and then catch some and, and look at the size ranges and make sure they're still spawning. You know, if, if the bass get to a certain size and they can only feed on certain sizes of bluegill, then the bluegill gets static. And when that happens, then they're starting to overcrowd a little bit, and you're not really getting where you want to go. Bev Root. Hi, Bev. Good to see you. I'm from our friends at Lake Vilbig. I love Lake Vilbig. I'm glad you're checking in. Thank you, dear. Anthony says, we did remove two huge otters last year. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Well, that's going to ring a bell. Could this factor in? Yep, I'm so glad that you asked that. Yep, otters can factor in. As a matter of fact, probably in the last, I'm going to tell you, two to three years, I have seen more problems with otters in private fishing waters than I've seen from cormorants. Maybe even in the last 30 years. You know, cormorants are selective harvesters. They're going to feed on bass gizzard shad. They're going to eat bass that are maybe up to 14 inches long. I've seen a, a cormorant eat 15 inch bass before. But otters? Uh, <laughs> I know Bob McFarland checks in on this thread every once in a while, watches it, but he, Bob and Donna, they live over in East Texas. They got a six acre lake over there. They love their wildlife. Their niche now is wood ducks. So they're the wood duck gurus. And Bob sent me a picture of a couple of otters three or four years ago sitting up on his dock. And he said, are these things a problem? I've never seen them. I know they're river otters, but are they a problem? And I texted him right back. And I said, yes, they are. They're going to they're gonna go catch your biggest fish on the coldest day. They're going to chew the guts out, eat as much as they want, and then leave, it, leave the rest of the carcass out there for you to see. Well, sure enough, it wasn't three or four weeks. He sends me a picture of about a five-pound bass with the guts chewed out of it that he found under his dock, where they left the carcass under his dock. Well, Donna wouldn't let him shoot the otters because they're cute, you know, and they are. I mean, they're, they play, they tumble, they cuddle. Let me pause for a minute. They cuddle. And you know what? In nature, in a natural environment, they're fine. You know, they're not going to disrupt a natural environment, but for those of us that are that are pushing the envelope of our ponds and lakes, when we get a seven or eight pound bass that's six or seven years old confined in a six acre lake, we don't want an otter to slip in there and eat it, but they will. So I, where I was going with this is about two weeks ago, I got a picture of Donna holding up a, a carcass of about a five pound bass where it looked like it had been eaten like corn on the cob had been eaten all the way around with the head and the skeleton pretty much left and found out that they decided they were going to do something about those otters. So yes, otters can be a problem. Now, uh, let's see here. Replying to Jack, Anthony McKeever. Yes, we use aquatic environmental. Okay, you need to talk to Greg Grimes 
because one of Greg Grimes' claim to fame is growing double-digit bass. Visit with him because there's got to be a reason that you're not seeing or catching double-digit bass because now as far along as you are, you should be seeing some. There's Jacob West. Jack Hamilton says, um, let's see here. I'm backing up, backing up, backing up. Troy Todd says it is legal to stock tilapia in Indiana. Good. I don't know that. I have a hard enough time keeping up with laws in my state. Yeah, Tim Wood Hydrilla is thumbs down three times. That's exactly right. Just like I said a while ago, if any of my clients show up with Hydrilla and they did it and they didn't talk to me, I don't want to work with them anymore. If they're not going to listen to some of those basics, I'm out. Jack Hamilton, will those tilapia get big enough to catch in the fall before time runs out? Probably. It depends on how big a tilapia you stock. If you stock tilapia in Indiana, they're a quarter of a pound a piece. They'll get to be a pound and a half by the fall. Now, here's the catch. They're not easy to catch. You know, they're, they're, they'll they're eat fish food, but if they're eating fish food, that means they're not out there eating algae. You know, so if you put in 100 and you catch 20 at the end of the year, you've done good. Now, what some guys do, I know what I've done this three or four times in the fall, when the water temperature hits, hits that magic number of about 53 or 54 degrees with tilapia Mozambique, they will come around the edge and just seek the warmth in the afternoon. And I've got these long handle dip nets that we use on the electric fishing boat. And we can go out and catch some of them. And that's that's what we'll do. We'll go try to catch 30 or 40 of them. On. And you only got two days or three days to do that. So you got to be on point looking for them. Then you can do that. Jacob West checking in. Daniel McCorder. Danny Mack. Thank you. I think I'll go for more bass. Do you have an opportunity to stock a few hybrid strippers? Yeah, if you want to. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, now, Danny Mac, here's your deal. Since you've got a recirculating pond, you're continually cleansing your water. So, you know, a pond the size yours is probably would behave more like a three-acre natural pond. Let that soak in for a minute because you, you have taken all the perfect things and made them concise. You're moving your water. You have currents. So, yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can add some more fish if you want. It's probably a little bit small for hybrid strappers, but that doesn't mean they won't live there. All right, so Jack Walker the th three, Jack Walker the third. I'm starting year two with my Central Georgia seven acre pond stock from Owens and Williams. You know, if you have uh, if if you have followed good stocking recommendations and you have gotten healthy fish, which from Owens and Williams, I've heard nothing but good about them. Then starting in year two, you're in production phase. So now you're want to, wanting to push those fish. If you really want to push the limits, then feed the fish. Make sure you got good fertility. What does that mean? Uh, check your water chemistry in the southeast where you are. Having a, um, a visibility depth. Get you a sechi disc. It's worth it. Spend 15 bucks on a sechi disc. Make sure your alkalinity is 40 parts per million or higher. Check your visibility depth. You, depth you're shooting for 18 to 24 inches of visibility from the time the water temperature is 60 until about the middle of June. After that, let the water go clearer. You know, let the water go down to maybe uh, 30, 35, 40 inches at that point. So, yep, all right. Jack Walker says, running Texas Hunter feeder. Good job. First time for, yeah, do it. Have some feed in that thing by about the second week of March, even if you're just feeding a handful of feed a day. You know, set it for two seconds or three seconds. And once the fish start to eat it, then increase your feed times. Feed a good quality feed. That's a big deal. So now I want to get back a little bit more on the topic I was thinking about is you can push your pond to a limit. And at some point, every pond has its limiting factor. Now for most ponds, like I said earlier, that's feed or food. Most ponds run out of food. But if you're feeding your fish... You can eliminate food as the limiting factor. Then the next limiting factor becomes water quality. Because for every 1.3 pounds of feed you feed, you're going to get one pound to gain and three tenths of a pound of waste. So that pond, now what, here, here, here is a fact of life and a fact of nature. You guys need to know this. Nature abhors a vacuum and it also abhors a bounty. And we'll get into that bounty part here in a minute because it's, it's really, really interesting. Took me a few years to begin to figure that out. Darren, dredge your dig after 20 years. I'll get to that in a minute. So uh, when when you got to understand your limiting factors, let's take Richmond Mill Lake, for example. That thing flows 
six to 10,000 gallons of, of water pH 5.3, zero alkalinity, zero hardness, looks like iced tea, six to 10,000 gallons per minute over the spillway every minute of every day. That is the least productive water I've ever met. So that, that lake has to have fish food to prop it up. Well, once we can eliminate fish food is a limiting factor, then the next factor in almost every single lake elsewhere is water quality. So if you're feeding fish consistently, your water quality tends to deteriorate. That may, that depends on how much flushing you have from fresh rains, depends on how many fish you've got and how much feed you're feeding. You know, but at some point, your water chemistry is gonna become the limiting factor. Now, if we can eliminate water from being the limiting factor, then the next limiting factor is going to be crowded fish. That's where I want to get into this bounty. I've managed quite a few lakes to where we pushed those lakes to where they were growing way more fish per unit of water standing crop than what the carrying capacity should allow. So in other words, we might have, there's several lakes where we might have 250 pounds of bass per surface acre of water in a 20 acre lake. 5,000 pounds of bass in a 20-acre lake. Okay, now what's the next limiting factor? Okay, think about that a minute. I'm going to circle back to it. Nature abhors a vacuum. So here's what that means. If you've got a pond that doesn't have any fish, you've got some fertility, you've got summertime, springtime, something's going to grow. That's the fact of life. You know, if you've got the right temperature, you got food, you got sunlight, plants are gonna grow. When you have plants growing, insects are gonna grow. If fish are present, they're gonna grow. So nature is always dynamic, always on the move, always changing. Now, so it won't allow a vacuum. Now the next thing, the other end of that, is it also won't allow you to have a, 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 a bounty or an abundance without making you work for it not only to work for it, but to keep it. Here's what I'm talking about. Dale Baden loves those Texas Hunter feeders. Toronto Madonna, sorry I missed you. Yeah, some, you know what? Rand Dad and I had a big time. You guys have got a good spot. I was over there. They live uh, outside of Fort Worth near Burles, in Burleson, Texas, and we uh, got to go help figure out where to put a little pond. They're going to have a cool spot out there. It's pretty, pretty cool. So, uh, Darren, I'll be back to your question here in a minute. The, uh, 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 the bounty. Anytime you have more of what nature wants or nature should allow, you're going to attract predators. Or if you've got, like for example, that 20 acre lake when we were pushing it to the limits and we had about 250 pounds of bass per acre, the next thing we started seeing is we had, I think it was five feeders on that 20 acre lake. And I started to see some incidents of bacterial infections in the spring and in the fall. So what was going on, what I thought, what I think was going on, is when those fish fed and the water temperatures were going up and down and up and down, they would bang into each other. Because, I mean, it's, vi it's a violent act when you have three to five pound bass chasing fish food. You know, and so they were bruising each other and there were some incidents of bacterial infection and we started losing a few fish. So I started figuring out that I needed to medicate the feed and change our protocol. So the way we changed our protocol is instead of feeding once a day for like 30 seconds, we changed it to three times a day for 10 seconds. And that seemed to make a difference because we spread the feedings out. The other thing that's gonna happen when those fish are congregated together, they're gonna be more susceptible to other parasites and other diseases and the weaker fish are gonna perish or the bigger fish will perish. So those are issues that you gotta pay attention to when you have an abundance. Another thing about the abundance is it attracts predators. Holy cow, when we got Richmond Mill Lake up and it was really cranking fish, you know, two, two and a half, three pound bluegills, just big numbers of four to six pound bass in its fifth year, which would have been like 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013 through there. We started, we, <laughs> I remember going out there, we, we thought there was something wrong with the timers of some of the feeders because they were going empty. We'll come to find out that the feeder brand we were using, raccoons were swimming out because all these feeders are on platforms. They climb up on the platform, spin the spinner, and eat the fish food when it fell out in the water. 
we started setting live traps on the feeder platforms and in three weeks, I think I've told this before, we caught 98 raccoons eating fish food. Well, beyond that, we started seeing bigger flights of cormorants so that the lake managers there were having to go out on morning and afternoon patrols to keep water turkeys off the lake. An alligator showed up. I'm pretty sure that thing was transient because it didn't stay but a couple of weeks and it left. But the thing that really started hitting that lake were otters. And the guys didn't understand just how big a deal otters were and what they were doing until they came out on the dock one day and they saw where five or six otters had caught seven or eight big bass, chewed up some of them and left them laying on the dock for them with a group of fishermen coming down to go fishing that day. So that's when they started getting serious about relocating, trapping, moving, getting rid of otters. All right, let's see here. I'm going to go back up again. So, so, so here, here's, oh, I got a story. This is a cool story. I'll never forget this story. Mike Mitchell, Queen of the River Consultants in Longmont, Colorado, back then, renovated trout streams in the Rocky Mountains. He called me one day, and we were just chit-chatting back and forth. He says, man, he says, it costs a lot of money to renovate a trout stream. By the time you get the permits, and you got to have a game plan, you got to get the plan approved. You know, you, you can't disturb soils. you you got to do these different things. So you're highly regulated, and rightly so, because you don't want to go in there and do something stupid that messes something up downstream. And he says, after it's all done, only the rich can afford it, and it costs about a million dollars a mile to renovate a trout stream. Well, after I let after my jaw dropped, and I listened, I, I know there's people that don't mind spending that much money, and heck, I'd be happy to help them. Uh <laughs> He said that there was a family, the, actually this family was from Fort Worth, Texas, and they'd had this ranch up in the, up in the south central Colorado for a long, long time. And this daddy, who was in his 60s, had grown up on that ranch as, as a kid. And he had, had Mike come in and renovate the trout stream to be some semblance of what it was when he was a little boy. So they built, you know, some pools and they use logs to direct the water to create riffles and rearrange some rocks and move some big boulders in here to create deep holes and they excavated where they needed to and added gravel and they did all the things that they needed to do holy cow there's john wilson he's hanging out with with uh, sue cruz and all kinds of folks out there from the dominican republic doing some some cool stuff i saw you on facebook today man good to see you the uh uh so anyway uh, Mike got this rich guy's stream stocked with trout, had some feeders that they could cover up with fake rocks, you know, so they could provide food for the trout. And after about three years, they had some trout knocking on the door of seven and eight pounds. Well, he got a call one Sunday just before he was ready to go to church, and this landowner said, Hey, hey, uh, hey, Mike, listen, I'm out here on the back deck. I just watched an eagle swoop down grab about a five-pound trout, drag it out on the shore, and he's eating it right now. Well, Mike, being the good fish guy, kind of bristled a little bit. You know, he kind of felt the chill run, run down his spine, and he says, uh, yeah, okay. he says, oh, wow, okay. And he says, you know, this is a, a young eagle hatched from a pair that's still here, and I haven't seen that since I was about seven or eight years old. He said, can you get me some more big trout? So in that case, the landowner got it. He understood that the bounty that he created attracted other things. You know, it attracted predators. And of course, a bald eagle is not necessarily a predator, but in that case, it was. Let's see here. Darren, let's go back to dredge or dig after 20 years. You know, I think you got to make that call on an individual basis. If you can figure out how much silt you've got, and, and also it also depends on how big the pond is. And where, you know what, I'm going to tell it to you this way. Sometimes it does make sense to dredge because if you don't have a place to move the soil, if you're surrounded by homes, you know, and you need the added depth, dredging can make good sense. Now, if this is a rural pond out in the middle of the country on a farm or a ranch, what you need to figure out is, is why would you want to dig it out or dredge it out? Is it because it's silted in? And if it's silted in so deep, 
then what you got to figure out is how much dirt would I need to move out to get the pond like I want. And then you do the math on that, knowing that it's going to cost probably, I'm going to go a little bit out on a limb here. I'm going to tell you it's probably going to cost somewhere between 6 and $9 per cubic yard to get that dirt out of a pond and move it somewhere else. Now, if it's out on a farm, it might make more sense just to move a few hundred yards downstream, build a brand new pond, and doze that one in and forget about it. So I'm going to tell you that it just depends on your site and the circumstances around the pond on what you should do about it. Let's see here. Drew Hay says, what's the size of a spring or stream fed? Okay, I guess she's asking Darren about that. So you guys can get together on that. Ron Kenny, speaking of predators, hooded mergansers, kingfishers, and herons or duddy visitors, visitors, any threat to the larger fish? Well, mergansers definitely are predators. Now, the good thing is they're migratory. So, you know, you can spook them on the way. Kingfishers, I think they're cool. Actually, I'm not too worried about kingfishers or great blue herons. You know, herons are typically solitary. I got to tell you, this story is pretty good. We're going to run out of time, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I was away somewhere working on a lake, and we lived at where we live now. This had to be probably 2003 or four, and uh, Debbie was out having coffee. And outside, we have a we have a house with a with kind of a patio that looks down on a half to three quarter acre pond with a feeder over in one corner of it. And she called me one morning. She said, hey, where's your shotgun? Well, I got a 410 that my daddy gave me when I was about 12 years old. I said, what do you want my shotgun for? She said, well, there's this big, tall, gray bird out there. And I want to shoot it. And I said, well, why do you want to shoot it? She said, well, because the feeder went off and it just caught a bluegill. I said, well, honey, he's just making a living. That's what they do. You know, gray blue herons don't, they're not a threat. And three or four days later, I got home. I was sitting out there with her while she was having coffee. The feeder went off. And I'll be dead gum if that great blue heron swooped down and grabbed about a three-quarter pound bluegill that I'd been feeding for two years, pulled it out, and started to eat it. And I got up to go get my shotgun. She says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go get my shotgun and scare that thing away. She said, you're not going to shoot lurch, are you? <laughs> she named that bird. So what I did was I changed the timer on the feeder for midnight and then we didn't worry about it anymore. Jack Hamilton, what can I do about blue herons? You know, the only time blue herons are going to hurt you is if they're catching your bigger fish around the feeder. And like I said just now, change the timer on the feeder for after dark and the heron will get the message. Now, blue herons, uh, if you've got quite a bit of shallow water, if you can add some dense cover where bluegills can hide, you know, some moss backs or something like that, then you're going to be more likely to not uh, have the predation that you that you're having now. So give your bluegill more places to hide, feed them in deeper water, and feed them at a different time of day, and you'll minimize heron predation. At this point, I'll also tell you I've never seen great blue herons disrupt a fishery. I've seen water turkeys disrupt a fishery. I have seen mergansers hurt a fishery. I've seen otters devastate a fishery because otters are going to eat the oldest fish you got. You know, but great blue herons, I've not seen that. Not seen turtles do that. I've not seen snakes do that. Billy Wolf checking in from Whitesboro. Sheridan Ashmore, I've dealt with lakes or ponds in the north that have a, have I dealt with lakes or ponds that have a lot of pike and muskie? Yeah, I've dealt with some of those. The, uh, hey, Willie Howell, good to see you, neighbor. Need to check in with you, man. We've been gone a few days. Uh, yeah, I've dealt with lakes and ponds in the north that have pike and muskie. The thing about pike and muskie is since they're top end predators, truly ambush predators, and they're going to be feeding on other fish, you know, they can disrupt your predator prey relationship if you've got some that are say 32 to 38 inches long now if you've only got two or three or four per acre they can benefit a pond because in the north ponds are notorious the ones that have large mouth bass are notorious for having uh too many bass too many bluegill and in that case muskies tiger muskies and northern pike can help manage that the thing about northern pike that I don't particularly like in a pond or lake is they can reproduce. Muskies won't. Tiger muskies won't. Tiger muskies are a cross between pike and muskies. I like those. Let's see here. Drew Hay, I couldn't agree more with you, Mr. Lusk, on your answer to Darren. Perfect. Thanks. You're in the dirt moving business, aren't you? 
You know, I, I just kind of dovetail in on that just a little bit. Uh, I learned that lesson back in the 80s. There was a fishing club over here near where I live near Sherman, Texas, Sherman Country Club. And they had about a two-acre pond that they wanted to renovate. So they put it out for bid. It was really amazing. I didn't know much about earth moving back then. Not like I know now. I know more about it now. But uh, uh, they, they had three bids for this two-acre pond. One bid was that a guy would bring in a, um, actually a drag line back in the 80s. Might have been the early 90s. Another guy wanted to cut the dam and push dirt out with a dozer. Another guy wanted to bring a tractor and, and dump trucks in. Well, the guy that wanted to do it with a bulldozer and push the dirt, cut the dam, drain the pond, push the dirt over the dam, he bid something like $15,000. The guy with the drag line and, and one dump truck he had, I think he bid it at $3,000. And this other guy with a drag with a, a track hoe and a dump truck without cutting the dam, he bid it at like eight thousand dollars. Well, they took the low bid. Well, got about halfway into it, and the guy with and, and they took the low bid, and what they figured out was the guy couldn't finish the job. And after so they they had to finagle with him. His equipment broke down. He said, "Well, I'm going to lose money." They said, "We don't care." He said, "Well, I can't finish." And so. It became a nightmare. A three-week project turned into a six-month project, and they ended up spending as much money on the low bid to finish the project as if they had just bulldozed that pond in, moved 200 yards downstream, and built another pond bigger and would have had a brand-new pond. So I think it's pretty smart to do your due diligence before you pull the trigger on that. Gerald Stein. Let's see. Jerry. Uh, Gerald, good to see you, man. Uh, Jake Grant says, Tiger Muskie, Sheridan said, I find it fascinating how pike and bass can share the same areas with the aggressive reputation pike have. Well, it is fascinating, but what's really fascinating more about that is the pike are going to hang out in grass and shallow water where the largemouth bass are going to be more like edge cover. You know, so the bass are going to be hanging out towards structure uh, off of points, quick access to deep water, and they can be quick enough they can get away. Some of the lakes I've worked on, especially one in upstate New York I remember real well, is we would see uh, tiger muskies would help control the bass numbers, but I bet, I, I bet out of every 10 bass we electrofished, three of them had scars on them, <laughs> you know, where they'd been hit and got away. So here's your take-home points. You can push a lake or a pond with its fishery to, uh, to excel and go beyond anything nature could provide, but once you do that, you got to be prepared to protect it by harvesting fish, and defending against the things that nature's going to want to do. Here's David Reich. What are you doing, man? I can be not, play, not playing baseball today, man. Oh, I know you're frozen, but heck, you're probably at uh, you're probably heck you're probably at spring training somewhere, dude. Good to see you. Uh, your boss is checking in from the Dominican Republic a while ago. So I'm going to sign off. I got to go pick my granddaughter up from dance. So the take-home points are: yes, you can push your pond. You can make it more productive than nature would allow. Got to do that by feeding, population dynamics, create habitat, manage your water quality. That's a big deal. If you do those things, then you can push a pond beyond its natural limits. When that happens, you got to be ready to defend it, protect it, and harvest it. So, hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm going to figure out what's going on with this dadgum phone. Are there temperature limitations? I'm going to answer one real quick. Nathan Barber, are there temperature limitations to tiger muskie? Yes. About the farthest south I've seen them is central Missouri. They don't like hot water. All right, everybody, thanks for checking in. I will uh, see if I can turn this thing off upside down because it's upside down to me. And, whoo, it ain't happening. There it is right there. All right, adios till next Wednesday. I'll figure out what's wrong with my phone. And see you later. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for watching. Bye.